Good evening, boys and girls, faculty and staff. Welcome to our second annual Black History Celebration via Zoom. I am Carla hernandez Matz. I'm gonna wait a couple of seconds because I know there's people that are joining our webinar and they're just popping on. And whatever classroom you are in, uh, just welcome. We will start shortly, but we are trying to give some time, some wiggle room for people to come on. This is an interactive Black History Celebration. We will ask you some poll questions. We will ask you some questions via chat. And so whenever that happens, we want you to participate and we'll let you know when that is. Uh, but without further ado, let's get this celebration started. The month of February is designated as Black History Month. In the United States, it is a time to honor the important role African-Americans play in the story of our country. The idea began as a week-long celebration in 1926, organized by historian Carter G. Woodson and others. It coincides with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass, a brilliant orator who escaped slavery and spent the rest of his life working to stop it, and President Abraham Lincoln, who issued the Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War, which led to the eventual end of slavery in the U.S. Others who fought to end slavery include famous women like Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman. Woodson's idea caught on, and soon schools and communities around the country began organizing celebrations, starting history clubs, and hosting events to learn more about black history and culture. The civil rights movement in the 1960s sparked even greater interest in the many accomplishments of notable African Americans, who excelled in all areas of life despite obstacles and hardships like scientist George Washington Carver, educator Mary McLeod Bethune, baseball great Jackie Robinson, entertainer Oprah Winfrey, and President Barack Obama. Black history is American history. Black History Month is a special time to focus on and learn more about black culture and people of African descent who have made American life richer. How is Black History Month celebrated in your school or community? So welcome, boys and girls. Welcome, faculty and staff. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is a uh, you know really important event for us. This is our second annual Black History Celebration via Zoom. So whatever your grade level is, whatever school you're representing, thank you all so much for being here. I know there's a lot of teachers and classrooms that are on here. Um, this is an interactive um, Zoom. So we will be asking you questions. We will be asking you to participate. Um, before we finish today, you'll be dancing as well. And we're going to be doing a lot of different things. We're going to be learning about people, about the culture, about music. And hopefully you'll have a very good time. If you are having uh, difficulty with your sounds, make sure that you um, are putting it in your settings that you're adjusting. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yes, all right, good. I see I see some of you participating with me via chat. That's fantastic. So um, you're gonna, you're also gonna learn a little bit about um, some of my colleagues here who um, will get on and they will be talking about different things, folks that they admire and you'll get to meet them. But for everyone who does not know me, my name is Carla hernandez Matz. I'm the president of UTD and I am a teacher and I am a, proud to be friends with many of the teachers that are on this Zoom meeting today. So we are going to go right into our second video here. I want you to pay attention because I'm going to ask you a question. Hello. Black History Month is um, a commemoration vocab word for black activists, another vocab word in who took took their time out to go fight, um, fight for what, what they feel is right. Like Martin Luther King had a speech that violence is not the answer and no segregation. We celebrate black people that helped us change history. It reminds us to be strong even in politics. Oy. What matters is what, what's inside of you and how you act to other people. It doesn't matter if you're black, if you're white, just always celebrate it because you know the, the the struggles black leaders went through in order for you to be here right now. Even though we may have the different skin color, we're still the same type of people, no matter what. And a lot of people 
They don't see me for who I am. They see my outside appearance, but they don't see what I have on the inside. It's very hard to grow up knowing that you're black and you have a lot of personal prejudice against you. I see it on the TV and then I'm like, is that gonna happen to my brother? Is that, is that gonna happen to my dad? And I always have that in the back of my mind every time that I'm home and they're not home. Black history is important to me because I have to remember where I came from and I have to remember who came before me. Because you have to look at the things that Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and um, Malcolm X did for us black people so people can't treat us unfairly because they think some type of belief. Because we're, we are all people and you need to stand up for our rights. There's still discrimination. There's still discrimination in all parts of the world, in all parts of the United States. We should still fight for what we believe in. We should still fight for getting what's right. Awesome. So that was a great um, video about kids talking about Black history. And I want to introduce you to my friend, Mr. Antonio White. Get the video. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Antonio White. I'm the first vice president of the United Teachers of Day. And I have a question for you. And that question is, why should Black history be celebrated? Answer in the chat, please, if you have the opportunity. So I'll repeat the question one more time. Why should Black history be celebrated? Put the answer in the chat. Oh, I see there are students or teachers that are answering. I hear, I, I see the chat so that we can learn from each other's or contributor, uh, contributors uh, of this great society. Ms. Washington. So we can honor the people who helped us gain our rights. Perfect. Celebrates culture, wonderful answers. Let's see what else. Celebrates that there are no longer slaves. We learn to appreciate all the African-American leaders that came before us the achievements that they've made to honor the people of color and everything that they've given to our communities, how we've come a long way and where we are now. Wow, extraordinary, extraordinary answers. I see them, they're still coming. The answers are still coming. While um, your answers pop in, I'm going to now, um, we're gonna, we're gonna read a book. It's called Catching the Moon. And it's read by two actors. These are SAG-AFTRA actors. So these are actors that belong to their union, SAG-AFTRA. And um, they are going to be reading Catching the Moon. And we're gonna ask you a question about this story. So I hope you're paying attention. Line Online brought to you by the SAG Foundation. I'm Kevin Costner and this is- Jillian Estelle. And we're gonna read to you a book today called, you might want to show them the book. What's it called? It's called Catching the Moon by Crystal Hubbard, illustrated by Randy DeBerk. And it's a story of a young girl's baseball dream. Marcinia Lyle loved baseball. She loved the powdery taste of dust clouds as she slid through them. She loved the way the sun heated her hair as she crouched in the outfield waiting for fly balls. And she loved the sting in her palm as a baseball slammed into it right before tagging out a runner. If there was anything in the world better than baseball, Marcinia didn't know it. She dreamed of growing up to be a professional ball player so she could play ball all the time. I wish I knew why you liked baseball so much, Mama sighed as she gently washed Marcinia's hair. Marcinia shrugged. Mama often questioned Marcinia's interest in baseball, particularly when washing field dirt from her hair. It's just fun. 
Marcinia said, giving her mother the same response as she always did. Playing dolls is fun, Mama said. Marcinia blew a puff of lather from her palm. Not as much fun as baseball. After Marcinia crawled into bed, Papa appeared in the doorway. What did you learn in school today, he asked. Um, Marcinia thought for a moment. Some history. Hmm. Papa crossed his arms. And how did your team do in the game after school? Harold got a triple in his first at bat, and Clarence tagged out two runners. Marcinia said eagerly, I struck out my first time at the bat, but then I caught a deep fly ball that would have scored the tying run for the other team. If I'd missed it, we won 11 to 10. Marcinia's smile gleamed like the noonday sun as she shared the details of her victory. We won the game, Marcinia said up once more. And you also ripped another dress, Papa said, dismayed. Then he kissed Marcinia's cheek and turned off the light, leaving her alone with the moonlight and shadows and her dreams of becoming a baseball player. The tiny house was still. Marcinia could almost hear her mother's needle and thread moving through the fabric as she sat at the kitchen table mending Marcinia's dress. After a while, Marcinia heard her Papa's voice. I wish she would think about school as much as she thinks on baseball. She wants to be a ball player when she grows up, Mama said with a sad chuckle. I just want her to be happy. She'll be what every other girl in this neighborhood will be, Papa grumbled. A teacher, a nurse, or a maid, Mama said softly. I'm going to score three runs tomorrow. Marcina promised the darkness as she clapped her hands over her ears. I'm going to hit a home run, too. The next day after school, Marcina went to the playground. The other girls stayed on the hardtop to play hopscotch, jump rope, or jacks. The boys were huddled at the mound, talking quietly. They cast excited glances at the man who was watching the field from the bleachers. Do you know who he is? Harold asked Marcini as she joined the group. He tipped his head toward the man. That there is Mr. Gabby Street. He's running a baseball day camp at this summer. Marcini knew about Gabby Street. He was the manager for the St. Louis Cardinals. He had led the Cardinals to the National League pennant in 1930, and the Cardinals had topped the next year by winning the 1931 World Series. What's he want, Marcina asked. Kids for his baseball camp, Harold said. It's going to be right here on the field every day except Sunday. Sundays are game days. What is the cost, Marcina asked. It's free. It's free, said Clarence. All you need is your own glove and baseball cleats, Harold added. Marcina could hardly contain her excitement. She would do anything to be one of the players in Mr. Street's camp. That afternoon, Marcina played with purpose. She scooped up grounders, catching them into her body to make sure they didn't bounce away. She slid into second, keeping so low she wouldn't be tagged. She kept her eyes on each pitch, waiting for a good one to send over the fence. She scored three runs just like she wanted and hit a home run. When Mr. Street approached the players after the game, Marcinia crowded in close so he could see her. I just saw some good ball, Mr. Street said, smiling. Who wants to come to my baseball camp and really learn how to play this game? Every hand went up. Mr. Street shook them all. He shook Marcinia's hand last. You've got a good arm, little miss, and you run fast, he said, but I don't take girls in my camp. Marcinia looked down so no one would see her disappointment. She began striking dust from her dress. Hey, Marcinia has been playing ball with us since we were little kids. Harold told Mr. Street. She's the only player we got who ever steals bases, Clarence said. Marcini was pleased that her friends had come to her defense, but Mr. Street didn't change his mind. As she walked home, she thought about how those very same boys had teased her when she first started playing baseball with them. Then they saw that she could run, hit, and throw as well as they could. The teasing stopped. They had let her play. Marcinia decided to give Mr. Street a reason to change his mind. Every day, Marcinia played baseball, and every day, Mr. Street refused to invite her to his camp. 
Then came a day when Marcini got tired of hearing him say, I don't take girls in my camp. That day when she was on third base in the ninth inning of a tie game, Marcini had decided to take the biggest chance in all of baseball. She decided to steal home. When the pitcher drew back his arm to throw the ball to Harold, Marcini had launched into motion. The catcher snared the pitch in his glove and ran towards Marcini to tag her out. Marcini had doubled back towards third. When the catcher threw the ball back to the third baseman, Marcini had turned and bolted toward home plate. As the ball sailed above her head, Marcini had pumped her arms and knees harder. With the ball speeding toward home, Marcini had dropped her weight and slid into home plate. She had stolen home and scored the winning run. While her teammates celebrated their victory, Marcini had planted her hands on her hips and faced Mr. Street. I'm a baseball player, she said. I want to learn to play this game as well as I can. May I come to your camp? Well, little miss, if you can steal home, you can probably do anything you set your mind to, Mr. Street said. You can come to my camp, as long as you have your own equipment. When Marcinia told her parents the good news about the camp that evening, her father was not pleased. I don't like you acting like such a tomboy, he said with a snap of his evening paper. Besides, you know we don't have money to spend The on camp's free, Marcina said excitedly. Equipment isn't free, Papa said. I have a glove, Marcinia said. Harold gave me his old one. You'll need cleats, and we don't have money for those, Papa added. So unless you're prepared to get them yourself, I think you'll have to forget about that camp. With another snap of Papa's newspaper, Marcinia felt her dream move out of reach. Mr. Street was at the field the next time Marcinia played. Before the game, she mustered all her strength to keep from crying. Mr. Street, she said, I can't come to your camp. I don't have cleats, and my father says we can't afford them. But thank you for inviting me. Although she was sad, Marcinia played as well as she always had. She loved baseball too much not to play with all her heart. Unable to sleep, Marcinia gazed through her window at the full moon glowing in the sky. It was so round and bright, like a brand new baseball. She reached to the floor and took up her baseball glove. She put it on and punched the pocket as if the moon would drop into it like so many fly balls had before. Marcinia wondered sadly if Papa was right. Maybe girls didn't grow up to be ball players after all. But playing baseball was her dream. And Marcinia couldn't imagine doing anything else. The next day after school, Marcinia was the first one at the playing field. Mr. Street was already there. And he waved Marcinia over. You're a good ball player, Marcinia, he said. I want go good ball players for my camp. He handed Marcinia a box and he watched as she opened it. Her eyes widened as she pulled out shoe with each hand. These weren't just any shoes, these were real baseball cleats. Thank you, Mr. Street, Marcinia was so excited she could barely squeeze out the words. She hugged the shoe to her chest. They were even better than stealing home. Don't you have a game to play, Mr. Street said, nodding towards the field. Yes, I do, Marcinia replied happily. Her fingers flew as she unbuckled her street shoes and laced on her new cleats. They fit perfectly. She ran in them, she jumped in them, she caught and slid in them, and she hit a home run in them. After the game, the boys rushed to Mr. Street, talking over one another about the game. Marcinia lingered at home plate. She stared at her feet, proud of the new scuffs and smudges on her shoes. They had been a little stiff at first, but now that she had played a good game of baseball in them, the cleats were exactly the way she wanted them to be. Mr. Street excused himself from the crowd of boys. I look forward to seeing you in my camp, he said to Marcinia. She gave him a hopeful smile, but Marcinia knew she still had one more person to convince. Before she could officially accept Mr. Street's invitation, she ran home and waited anxiously for her father to return from work. As soon as her father arrived, Marcinia showed him her new cleats. Now, Marcinia, where, where did you get those, 
Where did you get those shoes, Papa asked sternly. Mr. Street gave them to me, Marcinia said. He wants me to come to his baseball camp. Mm -hmm. Papa looked down at Marcinia's baseball cleats, which were already scuffed and dusted with field dirt. He must be a pretty good ball player for an important man like Mr. Street to buy you those shoes, he admitted. Then he smiled. You know I don't like charity, but I reckon we can't give those shoes back in this state. I'll have to thank Mr. Street for his generosity when I take you down to that baseball camp. Marcina could hardly believe her ears. Papa had agreed, her chest filled with joy, and she threw her arms around her father, hugging him hard. You'll see how good I am, she cried. Marcini felt as proud and happy as if she reached right up in the sky and caught the moon in her glove. She was on her way to becoming a real baseball player. She would make her dream come true. Good story. It's a great story. Okay, boys and girls, you have a poll question in front of you. Do you think Catching the Moon is based on a true story? Yes or no? We have about 35 of you have participated. We need more of you to answer the question. Do you think Catching the Moon is based on a true story? Yes or no? And while you're answering that, I want to introduce you to Miss Shani. Hello, boys and girls. Hello, colleagues. We're so great. Uh, happy to have you here with us. Yes, Catching the Moon was based on the life of Marcinia Lyle. Marcinia Lyle was born in 1921 in St. Paul, Minnesota. She began... She began, she began her, her uh, she began her career at the age of 16 as a pitcher for the Twin City Colored Giants. As her career took off, Lila changed her name to Tony Stone, which she thought sounded more professional. Tony Stone faced two major obstacles in her baseball career. First, she was African American at a time when professional baseball teams were segregated. Second, she was a woman at a time when women rarely played professional baseball. As the first female player in the Negro Leagues, she was often harassed by the male players. Marcinia was inducted into the Women's Sports Hall of Fame in 1993. She is also honored in the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York in the Women in Baseball exhibit in the Negro Leagues section. Don't forget, boys and girls, that Catching the Moon is an AR book that you can actually earn points for. Dear Tim and Moby, what was the civil rights movement from PJ. The American Civil Rights Movement was about having universal rights for all people, regardless of race. Before the 1960s, America was a very different place. In many parts of the country, African Americans were barred from lots of public spaces. Movie theaters, restaurants, buses and trains all had separate areas for black and white customers. African Americans also had to live in separate neighborhoods and couldn't hold the same jobs as whites. This practice of separating African Americans from white people was called segregation. Segregation was widespread, touching every part of society, even at school. One turning point came in 1951 with an African American student named Linda Brown. She was barred from attending the school closer to her home Instead, she had to ride a bus to a black school across town. So her father joined a dozen other parents and sued the school board. By 1954, the case had gone all the way to the Supreme Court. The court ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. 
It was a landmark case known as Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Well, it wasn't that simple. These new laws had to be enforced. And there were still lots of other laws and customs that discriminated against African Americans. In 1955, an activist named Rosa Parks took a seat on a public bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Soon the bus filled up, leaving no free seats for white passengers. When the driver told Parks to give up her seat, she refused and was arrested. Well, that was the rule back then in Alabama and throughout most of the South. African Americans had to give up their seats if any white people were standing. Joanne, Joanne Robinson, Robinson, another activist, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Baptist minister, organized a boycott of the city's bus system. Most black citizens of Montgomery refused to ride on the buses for more than a year. They chose to walk rather than submit to unfair regulations. The boycott led to a lawsuit, and in 1956, a Supreme Court decision banned segregated buses. But the fight still wasn't over. Dr. King and other brave activists organized nonviolent protests across the nation. During sit-ins, black students visited whites-only lunch counters. They quietly sat there until they were served, or until the store closed. As a result, they were often harassed, or even arrested. And Freedom Riders rode buses from other states throughout the South. They were there to make sure the buses were integrated, with blacks and whites sitting next to each other, like the law said. These peaceful protests were often met with anger, and sometimes violence. Yeah, it's hard to imagine how something like that would make people so mad. But people often feel threatened by change. The movement reached a high point with the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. On August 28, 1963, hundreds of thousands of people marched through the heart of the country's capital. Dr. King delivered his momentous I Have a Dream speech. The very next year, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 outlawed all discrimination based on race, religion, sex, or ethnicity. Public facilities could no longer be segregated, and businesses would have to make an effort to hire a more diverse workforce. The door to racial equality had opened, but there was still a long way to go. New laws were just the beginning. It took years of struggle before they were fully enforced. Well, changing people's prejudices, that's something no law can fix. African Americans have continued to face violence and discrimination. But dedicated activists are keeping the world's attention on the issue. The legacy of the civil rights movement lives on in these new generations. And in other groups who have been inspired by its successes. Women, immigrants, gay and transgender people. These groups and others are still struggling to be treated with dignity, whether it's fighting for equal pay, the freedom to live proudly and openly, or the right to simply be left in peace. If there's one thing we've learned from the civil rights movement, it's that history is on their side. You have a dream too? Let's hear it. All right, now Antonia White will share a poll question with you all. The goal of the civil rights movement was to do what? One, repeal segregation laws. Two, overthrow the American government. Three, build new houses and schools for African Americans. Or four, give African Americans more privileges than whites. Take a couple minutes, answer that poll question, and let's see how well you did. While you're answering that poll question, I want to give you two quotes from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The first quote says, it is not possible to be in favor of justice for some people and not be in favor of justice for all people. Think about that for a minute. 
But I want to leave you with another one, too, because they talk briefly about his I have a dream speech. So this quote simply says, I have a dream that one day we will live in the nation. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of this creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Those should give you some clues to answering that poll question. So the correct answer would be to repeal segregation laws. Looks like you did a very good job of listening and understanding. Thank you very much. Sometime in the early 1750s, a 22-year-old man named Benjamin Banneker sat industriously carving cogs and gears out of wood. He pieced the parts together to create the complex inner working of a striking clock that would, hopefully, chime every hour. All he had to help him was a pocket watch for inspiration and his own calculations. And yet, his careful engineering worked. Striking clocks had already been around for hundreds of years, but Banneker's may have been the first created in America, and it drew fascinated visitors from across the country. In a show of his brilliance, the clock continued to chime for the rest of Banneker's life. Born in 1731 to freed slaves on a farm in Baltimore, Maryland, from his earliest days, the young Banneker was obsessed with math and science, and his appetite for knowledge only grew as he taught himself astronomy, mathematics, engineering, and the study of the natural world. As an adult, he used astronomy to accurately predict lunar and solar events, like the solar eclipse of 1789, and even applied his mathematical skills to land use planning. These talents caught the eye of a local Baltimore Hello. businessman, Andrew Ellicott, who was also the Surveyor General of the United States. Recognizing Banneker's skills in 1791, Ellicott appointed him as an assistant to work on a prestigious new project, planning the layout of the nation's capital. Meanwhile, Banneker turned his brilliant mind to farming. He used his scientific expertise to pioneer new agricultural methods on his family's tobacco farm. His fascination with the natural world also led to a study on the plague life cycle of locusts. Then in 1792, Banneker began publishing almanacs. These provided detailed annual information on moon and sun cycles, weather forecasts, and planting and tidal timetables. Banneker sent a handwritten copy of his first almanac to Virginia's Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson. This was a decade before Jefferson became president. Banneker included a letter imploring Jefferson to embrace every opportunity to eradicate that train of absurd and false ideas and opinions that caused prejudice against black people. Jefferson read the almanac and wrote back in praise of Banneker's work. Banneker's correspondence with the future president is now considered to be one of the first documented examples of a civil rights protest letter in America. For the rest of his life, he fought for this cause, sharing his opposition to slavery through his writing. In 1806, at the age of 75, Banneker died after a lifetime of study and activism. On the day of his funeral, his house mysteriously burned down, and the majority of his life's work, including his striking clock, was destroyed. But still, his legacy lives on. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Miss Mindy, and uh, we have another poll question for you based on that story of Benjamin Banneker. And the question is, which of these people inspires you most? Which of these people inspires you most? And your choices are Carter G. Woodson, Rosa Parks, Mae Jemison, W.E.B. Dubois, and Madam C.J. Walker. So as you guys are answering that question, we're gonna give you some time to answer that. I wanna tell you someone who inspires me. 
And her name is Michelle Obama. I'm sure most of you recognize her. Uh, she is a former first lady of the United States. She was married to President, is married to President Barack Obama. And something that she says, I really take to heart. And it said, she said, one of the lessons that I grew up with was to always stay true to yourself and never let what somebody else says distract you from your goals. And so when I hear about negative and false attacks, I really don't invest any energy in them because I know who I am. So take that to heart, make sure that you have confidence in yourself and you will do remarkable things. And so the answer, the, the answers that we've gotten, a lot of people like Rosa Parks. Let me, let me end that poll and let me share the results with you. And you'll see a lot of people are inspired by Rosa Parks, an amazing woman, Mae Jemison, W.E. Dubois and Madam C.J. Walker. There were a few people. If you don't know who these people are, make sure you do some research. Maybe not enough people know who Carter Yeah, G. maybe Woodson. not enough people know who Carter G. Woodson yeah. was. So you need to research that. Thank you. And I have somebody that I want to share. So I really admire this person too, who has made tremendous contributions. Um, you know, not only to the media world, um, but has really broken a lot of glass ceilings. Uh, she's also part of SAG-AFTRA, and which is the Union for Actors and Journalists. And she's going to read a story to you now. It's Oprah Winfrey. Welcome to Storyline Online, brought to you by the SAG-AFTRA Foundation. I'm Oprah Winfrey, and today I'm going to be reading The Hula Hooping Queen, written by Thelma Lynn Godin and illustrated by Vanessa Brantley Newton. Today is the day I'm going to beat Jamar Johnson at hooping. Then I'll be the hula hooping queen of 139th Street. Jamar says she's going to be the queen forever. But last week, I almost beat her. I sort through my hoops, and then I pick out my favorite, and then I feel it coming on, the itch, the hula hooping itch. My fingers start snapping, and my feet start tapping. My hips start swinging, and I'm just reaching for a hoop when Mama says, girl, don't you even think about it. You know today is Miss Adeline's birthday. Then heat washes up over me, and I stamp my foot. Don't get me wrong, I love Miss Adeline. She lives right next door. Miss Adeline took care of Mama when she was little, and then she took care of me, too. She's like my very own grandmama. But Mama, I burst out, I can't help with Miss Adeline's party. I'm supposed to meet Jamara. Today's the day. Mama stands as still as water in a puddle. She gives me her look, and then she hands me a broom. <sighs> I sigh loudly. Then I start sweeping. But when Mama's not watching, I push my favorite hoop a little closer to the door with my toe. Mama and I dust every room and scrub down the floors. We polish each window till we can see clear to New Jersey. After that, I peel potatoes while Mama starts mixing up a special double fudge chocolate cake. Kamika, set that oven to 350 degrees, Mama says as she empties the last of the sugar into the mixing bowl and add sugar to the grocery list. Well, I push the button on the oven and I look out the window. It's already getting late. I bet your is telling everybody I'm too scared to hoop her. While the cake bakes, we make up plates of fancy sandwiches. Then Mama slices strawberries and shows me how to make whipped cream. When the timer rings, Mama opens the oven. Kamika, Mama yells as she checks the oven temperature. You only set it to 250 degrees. Miss Adeline's birthday cake looks like someone sat on it. Mama says we'll have to start over. Mama sends me to the store to buy more sugar. On my way out the door, I grab a hoop like I usually do. But when I get outside, I remember that I'm on a mission. Miss Adeline's party will be starting in a couple of hours. Mama has to finish potato salad, and we still have to make another cake. 
I don't even twirl my hoop as I hurry down the street. I don't stop to blow kisses to Miss Evelyn or wave to Mr. John in the bakery. I'm coming out of the store when I see Jamara and Portia hooping on the corner of 139th and Broadway. We thought you weren't coming, Kamika, says Jamara with a smirk. I need to get the sugar back to Mama, but Jamara sounds so smug, I can't stand it. Well, you thought wrong, I tell her. You ready, she asks. I was born ready. And then I feel it coming on, the itch, the hula hooping itch. Whoever hoops the longest is the winner, Portia says. As soon as she shouts, go, my fingers start snapping and my feet start tapping, my hips start swinging, and I just know I'm going to beat Jamar today. Neighborhood kids crowd around as Jamar and I hoop. Cars honk and slow down, trucks roar past, throwing up heat and dust from the pavement. Swish, swiggle, swish. Jamar frowns. You've been practicing some, she says. That's right, girl. A grin greater than the Brooklyn Bridge stretches across my face. The sun moves between the buildings and the sidewalk starts cooling down. But Jamar and me keep on hooping. I've got donuts for Miss Adeline's party, Mr. John calls out as he closes up the bakery. Swish, swiggle, swish, swiggle. Miss Adeline's cake, I shout. My hoop clatters to the sidewalk. I grab it and the sugar and race up the block. I can hear Jamara just laughing behind me. By the time I reach our apartment, Mama is madder than a hornet. Kamika Hayes, she scolds. I'm sorry, Mama. I saw Jamar and, girl, I don't want to hear that hula hooping nonsense. It's too late now. Miss Adeline's already here. You take yourself on into the living room and explain to Miss Adeline why she won't have a cake for her birthday. Miss Adeline brought her own music and she's got it turned up loud. She's sitting and she's listening to a jazzy blues tune. She nodding her head like a spring robin looking for a worm. Hi, Miss Adeline, I say. Happy birthday. Kamika, come here, baby. Come here and give me a kiss. So I come in close and I kiss Miss Adeline's soft cheek. And then I whisper in her ear, you don't really like cake much, do you? Baby girl, you know I sure do love cake. Chocolate cake with strawberries and real whipped cream on top. She pats my arm, oh yes. That's my favorite cake. Miss Adeline smiles at me. I try to smile back, but my heart is racing as fast as the roller coaster at Coney Island. I can't tell her about the cake just yet. Pretty soon the neighbors start arriving. Miss Evelyn's wearing her Sunday church hat, and Mr. John's all spruced up in a pinstripe suit. Jamar and Portia sashay in with their parents. They're still carrying their hoops from earlier today. Girls, I don't want to see any hoops, says Mama, firmly to Jamara and Portia. Okay, Mrs. Hayes, says Jamara. She flashes her big smirk and smile at me. Kamika, you're about done with hooping after today, aren't you? I smile right back at her. Don't you bet on it, Jamara. Most of the presents are still unopened when Miss Adeline says, Well, I do believe it's time for birthday cake. I swallow hard. Miss Adeline, I say slowly, we made a cake, but it didn't turn out right. Then we needed more sugar to make another one, but I didn't get the sugar back to Mama in time because I was hoping. I was trying to be Jamar so I could be the hula hooping queen of 139th Street. It's my fault there isn't any cake. No cake, says Miss Adeline, raising her eyebrows. I look over at Jamara. She's spinning one of Mr. John's donuts round and round on her finger like it's a hula hoop. Suddenly, that gives me an idea. I'll be right back, 
I yell as I race from the room. In the kitchen, I set a chocolate donut on a pretty plate. I add whipped cream and strawberries. Mama comes in to help. I put a candle on top and she lights it. As I carry the donut cake to Miss Adeline, Mama starts singing, Happy birthday! And everyone joins in. The candle glows as bright as the smile on Miss Adeline's face. Why, this is just about perfect, Miss Adeline says, taking a bite of her donut birthday cake. Now, Kamika, did you say you were hooping? Well, when I was a girl, I was the best hula hooper on this block. Adeline, don't you start that nonsense, Miss Evelyn says as she marches on over to us. You know very well I was the best. Miss Adeline looks at me. Baby girl, why don't you bring some hoops on in here and let me show this old girl what she forgot? My eyes find Mama's. She shakes her head, but Miss Adeline's already pushing back chairs to make room. Then she slips a hoop over her head, and right then I know. Miss Adeline's just like me. She's got the itch, the hula hooping itch. Her fingers start snapping and her feet start tapping. Her hips start swinging and before we know it, that hoop is swishing right around Miss Adeline's waist. And then she's got it swinging around her neck. And I glance over at Mama and I see a smile pulling at her lips in spite of herself. Miss mm -hmm. Adeline shimmies the hoop down past her knees. She spins it around her ankle as she hops on one foot, then the other, with the hoop still swish, swish, round and around. Miss Adeline heads for the door. Miss Evelyn grabs one of my hoops, and Mr. John grabs another. Even Mama's hips are swinging as the whole party spills out onto the street. Everybody's got the itch, the hula hooping itch. Pretty soon, hoops are swishing and swinging all the way down the block. Kamika, this is the best birthday party I have ever had, Miss Adeline hollers. Jamara hoops on over to me. Kamika, she says. I know who the real hula hooping queen of 139th Street is. I do too, I say. Jamar settles her hoop around her waist. You ready, Kamika? I was born ready, I say. The sidewalk is cooler than a spring rain, and the street lights shine like stars. Swish, swiggle, swish. The end. That was such a great story, hula hooping. And Kamika was trying really hard not to get distracted, but I'm sure a lot of you understand sometimes distractions happen, but she was honest. She told Miss Adeline the truth. And then she was creative because she came up with the idea for the donut cake. And so that was such a good story. Raise your hand in your classes if you like hula hooping. All right, I see some hands raised. I see some hands raised. Thank you so much, Ms. Carter, for sharing that story. Awesome. And so now we're going to move into movement because we were talking about hula hoops and movement and rhythm. And so we want to share with you all a video. It's the history of African-American social dance. So we will ask you a question about this. So please make sure you're paying attention. This is the bop. The bop is a type of social dance. Dance is a language, and social dance is an expression that emerges from a community. A social dance isn't choreographed by any one person. It can't be traced to any one moment. Each dance has steps that everyone can agree on, but it's about the individual and their creative identity. 
because of that, social dances bubble up, they change, and they spread like wildfire. They are as old as our remembered history. In African-American social dances, we see over 200 years of how African and African-American traditions influenced our history. The present always contains the past, and the past shapes who we are and who we will be. The Juba dance was born from enslaved Africans' experience on the plantation. Brought to the Americas, stripped of a common spoken language, this dance was a way for enslaved Africans to remember where they're from. It may have looked something like this. Slapping thighs, shuffling feet, and patting hands. This was how they got around the slave owner's ban on drumming. Improvising complex rhythms, just like ancestors did with drums in Haiti or in the Yoruba communities of West Africa. It was about keeping cultural traditions alive and retaining a sense of inner freedom under captivity. It was the same subversive spirit that created this dance, the cakewalk, a dance that parodied the mannerisms of Southern high society, a way for the enslaved to throw shade at the masters. The crazy thing about this dance is that the cakewalk was performed for the masters who never suspected they were being made fun of. Now you might recognize this one, 1920s, the Charleston. The Charleston was all about improvisation and musicality, making its way into Lindy Hop, swing dancing, and even the kid and play, originally called the Funky Charleston. Started by a tight-knit black community near Charleston, South Carolina, the Charleston permeated dance halls where young women suddenly had the freedom to kick their heels and move their legs. Now social dance is about community and connection. If you knew the steps, it meant you belonged to a group. But what if it becomes a worldwide craze? Enter the twist. It's no surprise that the twist can be traced back to the 19th century, brought to America from the Congo during slavery. But in the late 50s, right before the civil rights movement, the twist is popularized by Chubby Checker and Dick Clark. Suddenly, everybody's doing the twist white teenagers, kids in Latin America, making its way into songs and movies. Through social dance, the boundaries between groups become blurred. The story continues in the 1980s and 90s. Along with the emergence of hip hop, African-American social dance took on even more visibility, borrowing from its long past, shaping culture and being shaped by it. Today, these dances continue to evolve, grow, and spread. Why do we dance? To move, to let loose, to express. Why do we dance together? To heal, to remember, to say, we speak a common language, we exist, and we are free. Awesome. So, um... Awesome. So that that was the history of African American social dance. Uh, go ahead, Miss Mindy. So you see in there, in the history of social dance, which is your favorite dance move? Is it the cabbage patch? Is it the shay shay? Is it the running man? Or is it the cakewalk? We're waiting for everybody to vote. I know some of those, but I don't know all of those. I just want to dance like those girls. They were cool. All right, the votes are coming in and you can, I'm going to share the, the, the results with you in one second. All right, let me end that poll and share the results so that you see 
The most popular is The Running Man. I can do that one, Mindy. (laughs) You and me both. Followed by The Cabbage Patch, and then The Cakewalk, and then The Shea Shea. All right. So if your teachers give you permission um, and they allow you to, this next uh, video we're going to watch is going to be a music video from Beyonce, and it has dancing in it. And we encourage you to dance only if your teacher gives you permission. So with that, I wanna tell everybody, thank you all very much for joining us on our second annual um, Black History Celebration. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you enjoyed this last video too, because it is fun and it is going to make our bodies move.
Black History Celebration via Zoom. It's our second annual. We want to thank all of you, all of you teachers who um, joined us today and all of your students who participated in our poll questions and our Zoom chat questions. It's been a pleasure. It has been a lot of fun. And of course, United Teachers of Dade loves you, loves to celebrate. And we thank you for having such amazing teachers and all the work that you do in our classrooms, in our offices, in our schools. So bravo to all of our UTD members out there. Hope you enjoy this long weekend. Thank you. We love you. And um, let's celebrate. It's Black History Month. Have a great day and good weekend.